Hey guys, welcome to the Reinvest Podcast. Uh, co-hosting this and co-collaborating with Ross MacArthur with Follow the Deal. Uh, this is kind of new for us. We're jumping in and, and trying to provide our listeners, our audience with uh, some digestible content on really relevant topics within real estate. Um, so there'll be a couple of these uh, that'll drop. So keep your eyes peeled for those um, as a way to uh, stay you know, in, in tune and plugged into some of these different topics. Ross, uh, tell us a little bit about where we want to go today. Yeah, so I think uh, the three of us all dabble in this category uh, frequently and often, and it's probably one of the things that we get asked the most about. So it, it was definitely a topic that made the short list to talk about. So today we're going to talk about flipping, uh, fix and flip. So, and by the way, not everything goes like you see on HGTV. So just <laughs> preface that. That's probably why we're talking about this today. But it's probably in, in our friend circle, it's the number one thing people ask us about because it sounds so sexy. You're taking something ugly, yes. you're making it beautiful again, you're hopefully making some money while you do it, right? That's right. And everybody thinks oh. it sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll all tell you it's not sometimes as fun as you think, but it is a great, uh, a, it creates a great ability to make some money qu semi quickly. And as we always talk about, velocitize your money uh, heavily. So, so I'm going to pose this question to you guys today. Uh, usually you're the question askers. Uh, so what are, when you guys are looking at flips in your own uh, business, what are some key metrics that you look at to say go or no go on a new flip project? Yeah. It, and you know, just to, to comment and segue into your question, uh, it velocity, flipping velocitizes capital, but it also velocitizes getting reps in because typically, you know, the hold period is going to be a shorter life cycle. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get a really crash course case study on whole, you know, single family real estate, a lot of the principles and concepts you're going to use for buy and hold. Um, but I guess let's boil it down to some of the key metrics and then we can dive in on why each of these is important. But obviously, you know, there's the whole adage that you make money in real estate when you buy. And so the purchase is, is definitely a huge uh, starting point in flipping because it sets the kind of the floor and the basis for what uh, the money invested in the capital invested is going to be in that project. Then you got your capex, right? Your capital expenditure, your repair costs to make that uh, a beautiful property that hopefully you can sell to an end consumer uh, that's going to be able to to move into that. So what's the repair cost going to be for that? Um, this next one's going to come either from just being a local expert, knowing where to find information, or having mm -hmm. a good broker relationship, and that's ARV, which stands for after after repair value. So, what can I sell it for? And right now, you're in the information gathering phase mm -hmm. because you're doing this all on paper, so you can evaluate whether or not to invest your time in this. Um, and then the last thing that oftentimes gets overlooked is your holding costs, and then what's it going to cost to sell the property. So do you plan to pay a commission to a realtor? You're going to have closing costs associated with selling a property. You're going to have to pay utilities, especially in Ohio right now. We're moving into winter, and you're going to have to have the heat on. You're going to have to uh, have some of these these services on the property. Did you buy the the property with hard money? There's going to be some interest, extra interest, and holding costs associated with that. But really, once you have those four metrics, it's a formula. You know what I mean? You start with the price, you minus the repair value and the the holding costs. And then you're left with your ARV, the profit, you know what I mean? You kind of add all that together, subtract what you're going to sell it for, and boom, you uh, will find out very quickly whether it's going to make money or lose money. Are we money. talking about math right now? We're talking about math right now. Talking about math right now. So, Ross, let's get into the math of it. And can you walk us through like a case study of what we just talked about? Yeah. I mean, and so one, it, again, it kind of sounds semi-complicated when we go through it like that, but literally you could take a napkin and... So I think that's, okay. let's preface that. So let's, let's break it down that way. So it, it, you know, Seth, if you're selling me your property and you want $50,000 and I go walk it with my contractor and I say it needs $35,000 uh, of renovation to get show ready or flip ready. Uh, and I get, then I have to go figure out my ARV or my after repair value. I spent 85 in it so far and it's now worth 120. But where, this is where people make a mistake is they don't understand all that holding costs that you just mentioned. Yep. And I always say that that's about 10% of your ARV should just be penciled for holding costs. 
So generally five or six percent for a realtor uh, on the exit, and the, you know anywhere from four to five percent of other costs. Um, you know, a lot of entry level houses you're gonna pay for seller credit. You know, at closing credit, mm -hmm. you know things like that. That is all part of that ten percent hold. So that gets me to a total cost of net ninety seven thousand dollars in the project. So if I sold it for one twenty minus my expenses, that's a twenty three thousand dollar profit. Sounds pretty good, right? You know, that's not a bad deal. But what's really interesting is then you work backwards. So let's just say when you're going to talk to Seth, Seth says, you know, I want 60, not 50. So he starts at 60 and I do this math and now my profit is only 13,000. We'll get into what a good flip is here in a minute, but I'm going to say no. And I'm going to explain those reasons why. And then I'm going to go back to them at 50 because 50 makes sense most likely for all people. So it, it's really, when you explain to a seller that yeah, it, it's just a math equation, there's no hard feelings. Yeah. It takes the emotion out mm -hmm. of it, right? Let's, you know, kind of what your limit is, uh, the opportunity cost of either passing on that or committing to it and kind of, you know, sleeping in the bed that you made that way. Um, so let's talk about this. Let's kind of set a standard for what would be uh, like a justifiable return for somebody on a flip. Uh, this might, you know, there's a couple of variables to consider. So maybe you can get into that a little bit and then let's talk some numbers. Yeah. So one of the variables is, is the cost of acquisition, the cost of money. So, you know, in Florida, if you're going to buy a flip, it's probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, mm -hmm. in Indiana or Ohio or Michigan, a Midwest area, you probably can get into some flips for 30,000, 20,000, 50,000 in that range. So the cost to even start a flip is much higher in certain markets. Mm -hmm. So if it's higher, you're probably going to want a bigger return. But let's just assume we're talking Midwest right now where we all uh, are pretty active in. So if if I'm if my ARV is 120 to 150, I want to exit with about 25 to 30 thousand dollars of profit. Now the other variable is how hard of a lift is it, right? Right. If it's a gut job, a roof, and it's all the things, electrical, plumbing, and instead of flipping that house in 60 days, it's going to take me 90. Well, I might want north of 30 as my profit. But if I'm going in and I'm doing, you know, essentially a bathroom, a kitchen, some flooring and paint, well, maybe I'll take 20 and that's okay because I can get in and out of it in 30 days. And so I think that I use that standard for most people when I talk to them. I know you guys do as well, but it, it, you have to have some variables that based on how hard of a lift it is. But in general, that's a great benchmark. Yeah. And, and, you know, the lift is important. Uh, essentially, the longer that a project endures, the more exposure you have to a lot of things, to things that can go wrong, to added costs that you didn't foresee, mm -hmm. to, you know, longer holding costs. Uh, I'll blow the whistle on myself. My in-laws and I were like in the process of a renovation on a property for a year and a half. And that was just too long, you know, and there's a lot of factors for that. It was a great case study and a learning lesson. <laughs> uh, but let me, let me tell you the holding costs on a vacant property, uh, for that long are a lot, uh, especially you got to factor in insurance is higher on a vacant property. So there's a lot of things that you don't understand. So really being able to keep that window yep. of acquisition to disposition as tight as possible is going to be huge. So any okay. closing thoughts, Ross? Yeah, well, I was going to pose a question to you and then we can wrap up with some just kind of overall arching repair costs and things to think about. But, you know, what it, what in your opinion is the hardest part of flipping a house? Mm, that's a good question. I think the yeah. hardest part for a lot of consumer, you know, a lot of people looking to get into it would be the the actual construction portion of the flip. Mm -hmm. Because everybody can kind of wrap their head around maybe doing some napkin numbers, talking to their real estate agent. With real estate agent, a lot of times information is is uh, easy to access because the agent wants to make a sale or wants to help you sell the, the end product. But to actually find a good contractor that's going to help you come up with those numbers and then actually be accurate. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Not a contractor to walk through it with you and say, Hey, that's going to be $20,000. And then it ends up being $40,000 and you lost all your profit. So I think that's probably the most daunting aspect of it. And, uh, what, what kind of advice would you have for someone Ross that's looking for a contractor? 
Well, we didn't set up that question, but you answered it perfectly. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is, it, it's the contractor, right? It's the number one hardest thing to find. You nailed a lot of things. So this is no different than interviewing somebody for a job because that's essentially what you're doing. So budget accuracy, how big is their crew? Do they use subs or is it truly, you know, 1099 or payroll people who they use all the time? How responsive is this person? How transparent are they about what's going on and what the cost is? What is the quality? Ask for some references. All of those things are going to weed people out and then set the expectations of when you're going to start, how long is how payment is going to work, and how long that is going to do and get everything in writing. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't be ripped off because we all have been, but those are some of the things. The, the last piece of advice is, know enough to be dangerous. I am the least handiest person in the entire <laughs> world. But somehow I flip 25 to 30 homes a year. Like, right? Yeah, because right. I don't touch a hammer and I don't do construction. I find good people who can just like you guys, right? But I understand enough to be dangerous. So when you're looking at renovations and you're walking or, or talking to your contractor after he walked the property, he says, hey, it needs all new windows. Well, how many windows are there? There's 12. Well, I know what the average window replacement cost installed is $500. So that line item should roughly be $6,000, right? Mm -hmm, uh, right? I know a hot water heater is a thousand. I know roof in general is $10,000 plus or minus depending on size, right? Furnace, 2,500 bucks. AC is 3,300. Plank flooring installer, vinyl plank, six, $6 a square foot. Carpet, $4 with a pad. These are all things like, you know, you don't have to be, you know, a contractor to understand what a fair rate for service is. So the second part is, you know, once you pick the contractor, as you're going through his initial first bid, know enough to be dangerous. So that contractor is in the ballpark. If not, you'll be taken advantage of. Yeah, no, that's good. Would you just in closing, uh, and this is very specific, but um, I think it is important like what's um, a wise way to pay a contractor to get started on a project? I know we didn't plan for this question, but um, what's been in your experience that way? So there's all different ones. And if we're being honest, and I, I, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but sometimes contractors aren't as good with money as they should be. Uh, and that's just the world they are. They have high operational costs, AKA labor, and they have high upfront costs, aka materials, to kind of get rolling. So generally, we do draws. Um, so we do a small draw to kick off the project. Let's just say the project's supposed to be 60 days, $30,000. Uh, we'll generally do a 5, a 10, a 10, and a closeout is where we land. Mm -hmm. So that would be 30 if we hit budget. So, uh, and then in each one, you kind of know what the next milestone is. So maybe the five is clean out and demo typically. Yep. And then, you know, part two is usually drywall and it's kind of some staging stuff, maybe get into painting. Part mm -hmm. three gets into like flooring and kitchen and cabinets. And then part, you know, the last draw is usually the final touches and all the wrap up stuff. But I, I'm a pretty big fan of the draw because it allows you to inspect it early on in that relationship. Yep. And, 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 and again, it goes back to uh, trust, but verify. Uh, that's just a natural accountability thing uh, for you yeah. and for the contractor. Uh, and the key there is not to give them that money up front. Uh, because that's when people get, get into a lot of issues. I know for us, you know, sometimes if the project's small enough, we'll do, you know, half, a, essentially equivalent of the material cost. And then, you know, what they're collecting at the end is going to be their labor cost. So some of that's going to be dependent on the contractor. But hopefully today's been helpful for you as the listener to understand how to run metrics on a flip, how to really boil it down to the big rocks that you need. And then also very tactically too, like, you know, what do you need to do to execute on this? So thanks for joining. 